Shalom and welcome to this edition of Revealing the Truth, where we cover the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth. I'm your host, the Reverend Rabbi Eric Walker. I've got a question for you, a pretty serious one at that. What do you think they're doing with your DNA? Oh, you got that 23andMe kit, and you love the fact that you know who you are in your lineage and where you came from and where your people came from and who you might even be related to if you did the Ancestry.com entire spectrum. But all that goes into a database, and you've sent that information off to a total stranger. You really don't know who they are or what they're doing with your DNA. Now, you shouldn't really be that concerned. What's, what's it mean? You didn't send them your Social Security number. You didn't send them your driver's license or your passwords. So they really can't steal your identity. But maybe you've given somebody or someone a little bit more information than you thought you did. And that is your genetic identity and whether or not you happen to be in the line of Aaron. That's right, Aaron of the Bible, the high priest. There is a particular Y chromosome marker that identifies in the lineage of Aaron a particular marker that says that you may be in that line of Aaron. Well, what does that matter? Well, Jesus said on the Mount of Olives as he looked over Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you won't see me again until you cry out, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Well, in order for the Sanhedrin to reform and the head of Israel to take its rightful place, the high priest has to lead that group. And if Satan can take out the high priest, he can thwart the return of Jesus. Isn't that what he's been doing for the last 6,000 years? Is this stay of execution that has been promised in the oldest prophecy of the Bible, Genesis 3.15, the enmity between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent, contained in the pages of this book, a biblical thriller, sold out the first printing, now second edition is out and on special, the weaponization of DNA to take out the line of Aaron. A fascinating story, a biblical thriller beyond comparison, right now on sale, $2.99 on Kindle. And I want you to visit our webpage, ignitingandation.com, and scroll to the bottom of the page to special offers. Click on the orange cover of this book, let the Seven Laws of Abundant Living Lessons Learned from the Tree of Life. You click on that page and you're going to get a little box. We're going to ask for your email address. We won't send you spam because spam is not kosher, but we will send you the first chapter of this book that takes you on a supernatural journey of using the things of the natural to reveal supernatural truth. We take you from the dirt itself in the Garden of Eden all the way out to the fruit of the tree of life and how we see that tree of life again on the river of life in the book of Revelation. Get your copy today. I want to welcome in our guest, Michael Fletcher, author of the newly released book, Empowering Leadership, How a Leadership Development Culture Builds Better Leaders Faster. Michael has served Manna Church as senior pastor for over 30 years. In that time, he's seen the church grow from 350 members in 1985 to 8,600 members in 2016. Coupling sound biblical teaching with relevant practical application and cutting-edge outreach, Michael and the pastoral staff have worked to create an others-focused culture that lifts the advancement of the kingdom of God far above the concept of the stereotypical me church. Michael and his wife Laura have been married for 35 years, live in Fayetteville, uh, North Carolina. Yes? North, yes. Fayetteville, North Carolina, because there's a Fayetteville, South Carolina, uh, with two of their eight children. In their spare time, both enjoy training and competing in endurance sports with over 20 marathons, three Ironman finishes for Michael, and a 50 and 75 mile ultra marathon finish for Laura, uh, to their credit. Uh, Michael Fletcher, welcome in to Revealing the Truth. Thank you. You know, in order to get where you are, there had to be a little Michael back there in the growing up days that had some key influences in his life that would want him to take this journey into uh, possibly the highest calling. Uh, you have to serve in the role of fulfilling the highest calling, and that is uh, being a faithful husband and shepherding your wife's heart. The next highest calling that God gives us after that is to preach the good news. And Amen. so we, we really need to put things, uh, God first, uh, then our wife, uh, our spouse, and then our family, and work comes. And so in your case, God and, God and work kind of uh, uh, go together. It's both vocational and a calling. So when, when did that journey begin, and when did that calling come? Well, I grew up in a, uh, in a religious home. 
but uh, we went to church and those kinds of things. But I never really heard the gospel and didn't know Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. And so in the 70s, 1972 to be exact, right in the middle of the Jesus People movement, I had long hair and, uh, you know, wore rock and roll T-shirts everywhere I went. So I visited a church, had an Alice Cooper T-shirt on, visited another church with a deep purple shirt on, um, you know, just long hair, hippie type. And again, 14 years old, and a friend of mine who, who did not know the Lord uh, was trying to get his life together at the same time I was trying to get my life together. And so, um, I, you know, I almost got ripped off by the Baha'i. I went to a, a rock and roll concert, and I went to every concert that came to town. And afterwards, the band said, hey, come down front if you want to hear about our religion. So I went down front because I just wanted to see the band. And they said, actually, we're Baha'is, and if you go over to the uh, Sheraton, we'll have a room there, and we'll talk about our faith. And you know, I was struggling at the time. And so they told me, you could have... You have Moses and Jesus and Muhammad and Baha'u'llah in one small prayer. And so I thought, wow, this is amazing. I'm going to get the jackpot. I'm going to get all of it. So that's great. More is better than less. So I'll cover the gamut. And I waited to pray that prayer until I went home. And I had my friend who was not a believer. And I said, Alan, you won't believe if we pray this prayer, you know, we get all this. And he said, that's the dumbest thing I ever heard in my life. So... I was confused, and I thought, I prayed. I said, okay, Father, you know. Is it is it Moses? Is it Jesus? Is it Muhammad? Is it Baha'u'llah? You show me. Three weeks later, this same friend said, hey, there's a movie coming to town, and our whole church group is going to it. You want to go? So I went to a Billy Graham movie called A Time to Run. Uh, I listened to the message in the movie. I was crying inside, but I, I'll just, I was a Catholic, and so it really wasn't about the inside it was all about the outside so if i could get my outside together so i held the tears in i didn't want anyone to know i was that bad and actually went down front and there's a man down there and he was passing out tracks and praying with people and he said can i help you and i said well actually we came to see if we could help you because i figured if these people are crying openly they're really bad and they're admitting it that's how bad they are and although i'm crying on the inside just have to work hard and be good. And so he gave me a track. I went home and and um, prayed that prayer in the back, read that track, prayed it a hundred times, cried all night, and I was born again at age 14. What's interesting is that later, when I joined the church staff where I now pastor, I was doing a series on evangelism. I entitled it, You're the Only Jesus Some People Ever See. And I was reflecting on the reality that some people say that you have a special place in your heart for the person that brought you to Christ. And while I I prayed that prayer myself with the track. I remember the face of the man who gave it to me, and he looked a lot like one of our deacons. So I went up to him, and I said, hey, did you work the altar at a Billy Graham movie in 1972, A Time to Run? He said, I did. When I was in the Nazarene church, I sure did. And I, Do you remember a boy, long-haired boy, Alice Cooper t-shirt, came down front? He said, you know, I do. It's a Catholic boy, right? I said, yeah. Why? I'm not going to tell you. So then the next Sunday during the message, I talked about how you're the only Jesus some people ever see and how a man who was a plumber in the Nazarene church volunteered to work at this movie. And pretty soon, people started getting the idea it must be Steve Beck because Steve started to cry. Steve's wife, Jody, started to cry. And they thought, oh, so sweet. Steve's the guy who got that 14-year-old Catholic boy into the kingdom. So I said at the end of the message, and that, that, that man was Steve Beck, and I paused, and no one expected this, least of all Steve, and the 14-year-old Catholic boy is me, and then I was on staff, and soon afterward, I was their pastor, so that's my story about coming into the kingdom, and um, yeah, it was truly an, an amazing story. Actually, if I could just add one more part to it, we're a multi-site church, and um, we chose a location and transformed it, a theater, into a church. It was the theater I went to. And on the first day that we opened it, I told this lady back over, and I said, ma'am, you're in my seat. And she looked at me like I was crazy, <laughs> ma'am. You're No, seriously, that's that's my seat. And she looked around like she had to get up, and I, I told the story, and I said, I sat right there when I was handed the track, and so here we are, full circle. Um, and now Steve, who served as a deacon in our church for 30 years, is in heaven. Um, his wife's following Christ, and that's my story. 
Well, it's, uh, it's certainly a compelling story. Uh, I, too, remember the seat that I was sitting in when I came to faith. Uh, it was actually the, uh, what I call the Velvet, Velvet Elvis moment. Uh, you know, that no matter where you walk in the room, uh, the eyes follow you. Yeah. Well, this was when I heard the gospel preached for the first time at age 44, and the man preaching the gospel, I thought he was my Velvet Elvis. His eyes, you know, no matter where he went, it was like his eyes were on me. And what I came to find out is was his eyes were on me. Uh, yeah. the, the whole time he was very intentional about the message he was preaching to reach this lost Jewish soul. Uh, so, you know, we are overcomers by the word of our testimony and yeah. the blood of the Lamb. And that's why I always like to point out as a starting point everybody's freight journey. You know, arriving to uh, the, the Sias Church, 8,600 members, uh, you're not in a major metropolitan area, you're not in New York City, you're not in Atlanta, Georgia, you're in uh, Fayetteville, um, which most people don't even know where uh, Fayetteville is, right. uh, let alone having uh, multi-campuses. I looked at your pastoral staff and uh, the, the range of leadership, and uh, I can see why you would uh, go down the path of um, writing a book on leadership. Uh, when you came to faith, uh, it wasn't because of uh, a church. It wasn't because of a, of a um, structure. It, 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 it wasn't church. It was a movie theater. It was an encounter. It was, it was not what we call the, the, the standard traditional setting for the gospel message, but it was exactly where you were and where you needed to be at that time. You know, we all share the same spiritual birthday, and that is the day we were ready. Right? Yeah. Everybody has the same day in their life, the day that I was ready to receive the Lord. You have the exact same birth spiritual birthday. There may be different dates on the calendar, sure. uh, but we share that all in common, the day that our hearts were ready to be opened up for Messiah. Uh, when you joined that church and came on staff with that church. What was the leadership model that you were looking at? What size was the church when you joined it? And when you became the senior pastor, what were some of the challenges that you were facing yeah. that, that made you kind of go on this search for modeling uh, a successful leadership uh, empowerment program? You know, I was blessed to, after I was born again, uh, met Jesus as my Savior. My girlfriend brought me to church there, uh, here, actually. Uh, she's now my wife and the mother of my eight kids. Um, so she brought me there, and I thought, this is fantastic, because um, the church I was raised in it didn't give me the gospel. It had so much form without any substance to it. I'm, I'm not criticizing the, the Catholic Church. I'm just giving you my experience. Yes. So, um, but this was alive. This was, the church was very much alive. And it was led by a former uh, Air Force Academy grad who had flown missions in Vietnam. He was a tremendous disciple maker. And he added an, another player to his staff who was a tremendous disciple maker. And so I grew up in an environment where the leadership was involved in our lives. And it was, uh, I got this strong impression that they wanted to help me get where God wanted me to go. Um, and it worked when you have 200 people. Uh, that kind of process, that personal one-on-one, -on -one, discipleship's always going to be one-on-one. -on -one. It's always going to be messy. It's always going to be personal, but it was easier to do in a small setting. So when I became pastor, we grew a little bit. And that first year, you see, no one knows where Fayetteville is, but everyone's heard of Fort Bragg. Fort right. Bragg's the largest U.S. military base in the world, and Fayetteville is right beside it. So the average church, let me just add this because it's an important point. The average church in America has about a 7 to 8% attrition rate. That means that they can expect 7 to 8% of their membership to leave them. Either they die or they get a job in another city. They leave angry. They leave happy. Whatever the case may be, they, they leave. If you're near a college town, it could be up to 10%, which can be devastating. It's hard to grow a church when you have to grow 10% to grow, stay even. Our attrition rate being next to a military base where most of the people stay two to three years and we're 70% of our membership is military, we have an attrition rate of 20% a year. 
Wow. So we have to grow 20% to stay even. Now, that first year when I was pastor, God was merciful to me because the U.S. government pretty much just skipped us. They just didn't take anybody. But the second year, um, somewhere in the April, May time frame, people came to me, which is when they get orders, and they said, hey, we're leaving in June. Excuse me? And it was the whole children's ministry. You're, you're, you're all together. No, not all together. One's going to Fort Lewis. One's going to Fort Ord. One's going to Fort, you know, whatever. And I thought, man, I, I got to scramble and rebuild the whole children's ministry. So I did. And then I thought, you know, if this happens every year, this is going to kill me. I, I've got to figure out a way. I've got to figure out a way to help these people become leaders. Now, at the same time, this is still the Jesus people movement. And so people that were coming to us were totally, I'll just be honest with you, they were messed up. They're the free love, free sex, free drugs, you know, float around the country generation. So they were, they either they were hippies or they were hippies that finally found a job. Uh, and they were a mess. And I'm not trying to be prejudiced against hippies. It's just the way it was. So the church was a hospital. Well, I, I want, on behalf of all of us, uh, who were born in the early 50s, who are that generation. I was in college from 1968 to 1972. I know exactly the period of which you speak. Uh, on, on behalf of all of us, we take no offense whatsoever. Yes. We were quite proud of who we were, and yeah. uh, the mark we left on America was a dynamic shift, a paradigm change yeah. uh, that we're actually seeing again in this hinge generation that's coming up, this group of millennials that are changing the paradigm of relationships. So uh, it, it, it's, it's kind of cyclical and repeats itself in generations. It's true. Well, I found myself at a crisis point because the church was growing, but um, the burden was on me and my other staff member. Uh, and it was impossible to keep up. So, and it seemed that the people that were coming to us were, were in need of a hospital. And um, uh, so, segue, uh, an elder handed me a VHS, which for those of you who don't know, <laughs> it's a video cassette. Right. It's not, a, it's the pre-CD, okay? So he handed me one of those and he said, you need to watch this. And, you know, as a pastor, people give you books and tapes and stuff and say, please watch or please listen. But you, you just, I have a, if I could turn my computer, I have a stack right here on my desk of those. So when people say to you, did you read the book? You say, it's in the stack, which means maybe one day I'll get to it. But right. when an elder gives you something, eventually you have to. And so it was actually uh, a video recording of a man named Tommy Barnett, a huge church and great church, great leader, patriarch in the body of Christ in America, uh, in, in Phoenix, Arizona, First Assembly of God. And he was teaching his now famous pastor school, and he made a statement. So the the TV VCR combo is at the end of the conference table, and I'm at this end of the conference table with my pen out, signing letters, doing work, listening, kind of listening, kind of not. So I can say, I listen to it. I hate to admit it, but it's true. And he made a statement. He said, everything you need to reach the city, your city's already in the house. And I looked up, and I thought, he didn't just say that. So I rewound the VHS, and I listened to it again, and it made me angry. And I actually spoke back to him like he could hear me. I had an argument with him, but he, he didn't change his message. I said, it's easy for you to say you have 12,000 people. So I moved on and I did some more letters. And I looked up and I said, that is so disrespectful. And I rewound it. I probably rewound it 10 times. And I said, you shouldn't tell people like me that because you give us false hope. You may have 12,000 people. And I'm sure everything you need to reach a city is already in your house, but not in our house. So pretty soon I quit arguing because I realized it was God who was speaking to me, and I broke down. Um, and I just looked, I just stopped it, and, I, and Tommy was frozen right there. And I realized it was God talking to me, and I just said, Lord, if that's true, and I think it is, then I don't see these people like you see these people. That was the beginning of an awakening. And I thought, you know what? I've been seeing these people as... You know, broken people that I put back together so they could help me fulfill my vision. They need to give money, volunteer, and don't cause trouble. And I don't think that's what you're after. Uh, and I began to, you know how when God shows you something, pieces of scripture kind of fall in place. Yes. 
So the scripture said, Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. He didn't say, I will build my church. He, and excuse me, he didn't say, I will build your church. And he didn't say, you will build my church. He said, basically, Michael, I don't want you to build the church. You don't know what you're doing. I'll build my church. So you build the people, discipleship, mentoring, leadership development. You pour your life into them. Help them realize their dreams. Help them realize their calling. Help them walk into the purpose God has for them. If you do that, I'll build the church, and I promise you, hell won't be able to stop it. So I began that day saying, you know what? I need to start developing leaders. I've got to figure out a plan. And I was young and stupid. So, well, I may be old and stupid now, but anyway, I was young and more stupid then. So in the middle of one of the sermons I was preaching, I stopped and I said, look, if any of you in this room see anything in me you think you want in you, meet me in room, I don't know, 213 or something. I forget the number. On Saturday at 9 o'clock. And I started a little discipleship group. Had 40 people. Eventually went down to about 25 I realized Sunday was a bad, Saturday was a bad day. Soccer, ballet, basketball, baseball, picnics, you know. So I moved it to Sunday morning at 6 o'clock. So for 25 years, I ran that group, discipling people, meeting with them. And every morning at 6 o'clock, I reason that you're not missing a family breakfast. Kids don't have any lessons they're working on. Um, there's no soccer at 6 a.m. on Sunday. All my pastor friends said, you're crazy. You're giving the best of yourself to a handful of people um, instead of the crowd. And I said, here's the problem. Here's the difference between me and you. You're building a crowd, and I'm building an army. So all those people that I mentored and discipled began doing it in the local church. Next thing you know, we've got a small army of leaders, and the leaders are mentoring leaders. Um, I got a little more formalized as the church got bigger, and I started spinning off groups. I had other leaders leading groups, and then we developed a leadership development pipeline, and the rest is history. So that's my early formation in terms of how I perceive church the way I do today. Michael, the most profound statement to come out of your mouth <clears throat> in all of that is the last line of Acts chapter 2. And God added to their numbers daily those being saved. Why? because they had fellowship together, they broke bread together, they prayed together, they supported each other, they encouraged each other, they equipped each other, they sold what they had, and they took care of each other, and they had everything in common, meaning they had a vision in common, and they didn't have to worry about building the church. God says, and God added to their numbers daily those being saved. And we have now taken this burden of salvation, like I'm responsible for salvation. No, you are not responsible for salvation. You are a messenger. You are the prophet of the congregation. You are actually the diagnostician. You are the doctor writing a prescription every week in your message based on what you are, revelation of the Holy Spirit, how connected you are to the needs of the people, and you might find, as I did when I was in the pulpit, that my friends in Israel were preaching on the same subject. And my friends in Ukraine were preaching on the same subject. And my friends in South America were preaching on the same subject. And we hadn't compared notes and we hadn't talked and say, listen, I just went through this really profound eight-week series. And they say, really? So did I. And you find out that the body and the Holy Spirit uh, are supposed to be indelibly connected with this transfusion from heaven. And the second most profound thing that you said, which is the model for marriage, the model for families, the models for uh, business, is that, Lord, let me see that person how you see that person. Let me use your lenses. If my vision is not clear, I go to the eye doctor to get a new prescription. Give me a new set of lenses. Let me see in them what you see in them, and then show me how to be the hose which washes off the dirt of that beautiful hoopty, that beautiful old car, that beautiful may be an antique, all right? but I'm going to make it and polish it and make it shine. I don't have to build the car. You built the car. Right. I just need to tune it up 
clean it up and get it back on the road because that's what you want me to do. We're talking with Michael Fletcher, pastor and, and leadership builder, uh, kingdom builder, not kingdom like Cain uh, who built a city for himself, but a, king, a man who builds for the Lord. Uh, author of Empowering Leadership, How Leadership Development Culture Builds Better Leaders Faster. We're going to take a short break, and when we come back, we're going to talk about some of the concepts, the model of Chick-fil-A uh, and the serve leadership uh, evaluation questions that Michael says, if you got to, got to ask these questions of yourself and your leaders uh, and your people uh, as to whether or not they um, really are... Uh, on the track that they need to be on to build and equip. And this is in fulfillment of the equipping of the saints for the work of the Lord. We'll be right back. back. Shalom. I'm the Reverend Rabbi Eric Walker, Executive Director of Ignatica Nation and host of the daily TV program Revealing the Truth, seen live every Monday through Friday from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. Central Standard Time at www.ianbn.com and then replayed throughout the day and night via our website. All of our segments can be seen on the Igniting a Nation YouTube channel. Since our launch in January of this year, we've expanded our global reach to over 54 countries with a social media following of over 125,000. Our commitment is to bring you the most in-depth interviews with authors, subject matter experts, and thought leaders from around the world. We have interviewed guests from Israel, Brazil, England, India, and all across North America. All of our authors are featured on the Books and Media page on our website, www.ianbn.com. There you can find a direct link to the book you want to order, and we receive a small commission directly from Amazon. There is no cost to you for this service. In addition to our daily teachings and interviews, we make available to you the archive of all of the interviews on our YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram channels. Our live program is available from our homepage, and there is never a charge to you for any of this access. We made the decision long ago that we would remain a commercial-free resource that would not be influenced by any pressure from any outside company. There are only two ways that we are able to continue to operate this ministry and provide you with the only live four-hour daily Christian television talk show program. The first is through your support and tax-deductible contributions to Igniting a Nation. These can be made directly through the donate button on the website or sent through the mail to Igniting a Nation, 2700 Corporate Drive, Suite 120, Birmingham, Alabama, 35242. The other way we support the program is by offering you a unique opportunity to have access to over 10 years worth of teachings on a subscription basis. The teaching archives contains all of my prior sermons, Torah studies, prophecy in the news videos, and much more for the low subscription price of $5 per month. This subscription grants you unlimited access to over 800 hours of content not available elsewhere and is updated weekly with the most current prophecy classes. In addition to 20 hours of original TV programming each weekday, we invite you to join us live every Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday evenings for our Prophecy in the News classes. The times and locations are listed on our events page on the website www.ianbn.com. Every day, you and I are faced with the challenge of where we will go to hear the truth. We are committed to bring you the only program of its kind that covers the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth. We cannot do this without your support. Since we launched on January 5, 2017, we have aired over 300 individual teachings, interviews, and commentaries not available anywhere else. We are now working side by side with almost every major Christian publishing house to bring you the most in-depth feature interviews possible. Our one-hour features address every subject that affects the believer's life. We are hearing of salvations from the Middle East, Africa, and all across the United States. Lives are being changed every day 
and we have only just begun. Our mission is to become your trusted resource and grant you access to the people, tools, and information you need to grow in your relationship with the Lord. You can help us by liking us on social media and through your financial support. We know you have many choices in who you support, but we are prayerfully asking you to consider helping us keep revealing the truth, true to our calling, to cover the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth like no other program available. Donate today and help us bring the message to the four corners of the earth. Visit www.ianbn.com and donate, buy a book, or subscribe to our teaching archives. Without you, we do not exist. Back. Shalom and welcome back to this edition of Revealing the Truth, where we cover the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth. I'm your host, the Reverend Rabbi Eric Walker, and we're talking with Michael Fletcher, author of the newly released book, Empowering Leadership, How a Leadership Development Culture Builds Better Leaders Faster. Michael, welcome back to the program. Thank you. As you began to look at models and uh, not having come out of a strong corporate background where you were taught the Xerox method as I was raised up under the Xerox method of selling, uh, value selling, uh, you, you know, incentivizing sales forces and in the business world, the business model we used to raise leaders, um, you kind of went after a, a kind of a similar journey, kind of related to the fact that Jesus made a statement when his parents asked him, what are you doing? He said, I'm about my father's business. Now, we don't want to call churches a business, but we have people, assets, money, we have uh, facilities, we have depreciation, we have acquisition, we have it's, it's kind of a business. Yeah, there, there is definitely, there's definitely a science to church, a business to church, the spirit of churches, all of that. Yeah, it really is. So where did you turn to for learning? You, you, you came to this crossroads of realizing I've got to raise up leaders, uh, but I didn't come out of a raise up leader, organized structure, right. uh, John Maxwell or, or any of these other programs. I've got to do this. And where did you go to, to equip yourself first before you could equip others? Yeah, um, so we're on a journey. And in the book, I talk about our journey toward developing a leadership development culture. Everyone wants to develop leaders, so they create like classes. But classes only make people smarter. They don't actually deal with the biggest part of their lives, which is their character. Right. So, you know, this discipleship, mentoring, um, leadership development, for me, those are synonyms. And so we had the one-on-one -on -one relationship. We had the small group relationship. As the church got bigger, I said, got to streamline this process a little bit. We created what's called a leadership development pipeline. Um, but the, but the, the biggest question is, what, what's a leader? Is a leader born or is a leader built? And the answer is yes. Well, okay, but what does a leader look like? And so um, I was with a group called Leadership um, Network, um, they actually helped publish this book. Uh, this book is in the next series of leadership development, of leadership network. And so I was at one of their learning communities, and um, they had the vice president of Chick Fil A. He had written a best-selling book uh, called Se "The Secret: What Great Leaders Do." And uh, here's what I learned: as he told his story, his journey, it was it was kind of like a parallel journey, but they were so much more developed than we were at the time. So. He said we were commissioned by uh, Chick-fil-A to develop better leaders faster. So I actually stole that tagline, building better leaders faster, from the mission that Chick-fil-A gave their top leadership team. So for two years, they studied leadership. At the end of two years, they came to this conclusion. They found 6,000 different definitions of leadership, and they identified 1,234 practices that leaders do. So they sat around in this room feeling like abject failures. How are we going to go back to the senior leadership team and say, we have 6,000 definitions of leader, and we're going to train our ex associates in 1,234 practices? So in exasperation, they just kind of dropped their stuff. What are we going to do? One of the ladies on the team raised her hand and said, 
why don't we just go back to the greatest leader who ever lived, which is Jesus, and do what he did? And they said, that's a genius idea. What did he do? Well, he served. So when she said he served, it, they had like a, a, a moment where they realized, S-E-R-V-E. You know, do these practices all fit into those five categories? And sure enough, as they quantified these 100, excuse me, 1,234 practices, they fit in five categories. The S, see the future. Leaders, see the future. In other words, they know how what they're doing in the organization fits into where the church is headed or the organization is headed. So I thought, yeah, vision, I could do that all day. So see the future, engage and develop others. There's the discipleship component. How do you bring people into your lane of ministry and into relationship so you can help develop them, not just in their skills, but in the character? You know, they say that of an iceberg, 80% is beneath the surface, 20% is above. In leadership, that's a beautiful analogy because 20% of leadership is skills, 80% is character. So getting beneath the surface is the real issue, isn't it? So there's so see the future, engage and develop others, reinvent continually. How can we do this better? That is, church members taking responsibility for their own lane to improve their own lane, not waiting for the guy in the top to tell me what to do, but really truly becoming leaders. So see the future, engage and develop others, reinvent continually, value relationships and results. Some people lend toward relationships, forget results. Some people lend, lead toward relationships, excuse me, results, forget relationships. But we've got to develop relationships with these people as we work together. And then finally, the, the E is embody the values. And so I said, that's what a leader is. And I stole, <laughs> I, mean, I give credit in the book, so I didn't really steal it, okay? Lest someone, you know, call somebody and the police come and collect me this afternoon. Uh, we stole metaphorically their definition of leader because I thought this is exactly what Jesus taught. Help people see their future, help people um, engage and develop other people, help people learn how to reinvent themselves and who they are moving forward, help people love people and also love results, and help them live these values. And so we stole that model, and, and we've been using it in our, in our growth track. What are you finding is dynamically um, changed as you've embraced this multi-campus environment, uh, you're still the senior pastor. Do you have an executive pastor that handles the plant property and equipment aspects of it, or does that fall within your realm? No, we have, I have, um, I'm the senior pastor. We have a lead pastor under me, and there are three executive pastors, and all the properties and all that kind of stuff is, is in the responsibility of one of those guys. We actually also have a, a multiply strategy for planting churches, so we're planting a version of Manor Church near every U.S. military base in the world. Um, so those executive pastors have quite a bit <laughs> on their plate. But the beauty of this model was it gave common language. And the most important thing about everything is the culture. So culture trumps everything. You can preach a sermon series, and if it's you're, you're going to revert to form. You're going to go back to the culture. So it gave language. This, this model from Chick-fil-A gave language to what we believe about leadership development and now everybody at every site, we have a site in Hawaii, we have one in Florida, we've got one in Colorado Springs, uh, we've got them around North Carolina. Um, so it gives common language. And it, when you speak the same language, uh, then you have the same culture, and you can develop better leaders faster. Uh, you, you take people through a series of questions in this serve analysis, uh, questions that uh, require um, kind of a uh, it's your serve leadership evaluation questions uh, to find out whether or not um, you know how people are tracking so it, it's measurable it's kind of quantifiable uh, and it it tracks with that serve model but these are, f are basic questions to ask and kind of score yourself as to how you're doing. What are those questions? Um, <clears throat> well, it's really more organic. We have a growth track, and a growth track is a leadership development um, pipeline. It starts with, leaders, it starts with uh, first step, which deals with the basic elements of the Christian life, and then we go to next step, which is who we are, 
why we are, where we're going, and what's your part. And then leadership helps people understand um, who they are in terms of, we talk about mentoring, six different models of mentoring, and we help people try to discover which one of those they naturally are so that when, when they engage in people, they know what, what, how they're made and what they tend to give and what people can expect. We talk about 12 uh, operational principles, how we op why we do what we do the way we do it. Um, and then we, and we, we close that out with how to lead a small group. And now we've added to that growth track what we call multi-step, where we're training people to start microsites in military bases all around the planet. So all that's built into this growth track, and every one of our uh, campuses at every one of our locations takes people through that growth track. It's kind of, it is the leadership development pipeline. One of the things that is my personal observation is if people are not flowing in their spiritual gifts, they'll become dissatisfied with the church. Yep. Um, kind of the good to great model uh, introduced in an outstanding management book. Do you have the right people on the bus? And then once you look at the organization, are they in the right seat on the bus? Yeah. And in ministry, we have the added component of spiritual gifting. And we need to assess and take an inventory of that spiritual gifting. Because if I put somebody counting the offering that has the gift of hospitality, they're going to become pretty disenchanted with the church. They're going to find everything wrong with it, and they're going to start poking holes in it and ultimately leave. And you go, well, we didn't do anything. No, what right. you did was you missed it. You put a person with the gift of hospitality, and you isolated them, and they want to be out there running the usher team. They want to be there and the, serving the coffee line. They want to be out with people, and you're sticking them back in a dark room to count the offering. And so how does this play into your model? Thank you for asking that, because that really gets to the heart of it, doesn't it? it does. So this, this whole thing about um, leadership development pipeline, see, the, the real rush today in leadership is for people to find a pipeline, and it will produce the disciples for them. You can never take the one-on-one -on -one messiness out of this. There, someone needs to know who you are. And so we use a, a model that's similar to the to spiritual gifts is a little broader. It's actually Rick Warren came up with it, it's in, and he entitled it Shape. So what are your spiritual gifts? What do you have a heart for? H. A, what are your abilities? P, what's your personality? And then E, what are your experiences? And we try to help people get into the place that they need to be. See, you know, you know what causes that problem, though? When a pastor, and I'm not trying to be critical, but just to be completely honest, this is the way church works in America today in, in large part. When a pastor starts with his vision for the church, then what he needs are volunteers to just get in line and make the system work. It doesn't matter if the volunteer fits that spot or not. Right. Just, just do it. But now, if you have a leadership development model of ministry, it doesn't start with a pastor's vision. It starts with a person who's sitting across the desk from you. What are you made to do? What is your calling? What's going to help you find um, fulfillment? Where are you going to best develop? So you do have to assess who that person is, and we use, of course, shape, their spiritual gifts, their heart, their abilities, their personality, their experiences, and we try to help them find the spot which works best for them. Um, we even talk about how to fire, a, a, we don't use the term volunteer, we call them serve team members after the um, Chick-fil-A model, but, but we talk about how, how do you fire a volunteer? How do you say, you're, you're not working, and here's how we fire a volunteer, I owe you an apology. Why do you owe me an apology? Why do I, because I put you in a place that isn't best for you. You're not happy where you are. That's not your fault. That's my fault. I put you in that spot, in that right. lane. It's not how you're made. So please forgive me, and let's find a place where you really fit, where you can find fulfillment. Because you're exactly right. If people are in a lane that's made for them, then the people who are in that lane are like them, and, and people flock. And you can see it on a team that's healthy, there's relationship, they do stuff outside of church, they're connected with each other, they feel like they're making a difference. But when you find a person and stick them in a spot just to make your system work, you're actually not helping that person. You're using that person, not developing that person. Old model that I was raised up under is just because you have a need doesn't mean you should fill it until you find the right person. 
Yeah, you're right. Uh, you know, we all have needs. We all need an extra body somewhere. We always need an extra something somewhere. Uh, it's 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 uh, seems to be quick to hire, slow to fire. Uh, because of the reluctance of hurt, uh, I completely agree with you that we as leaders should take the responsibility and present it exactly that way. I completely witness to what you're saying in the fact that we have the wrong people. Uh, how do you address, uh, and, and this is a, a, a very sensitive area, You've invested, you've built what you think is a leadership team, but uh, because we are flawed, because we are broken, because we are whatever we are, we're in this, we're, we're a leaky vessel because light only can shine through a cracked vessel. Light can't shine through a solid vessel. So in order for our light to shine, we've got to be a, a, a little bit broken, a little bit cracked so the light can come, come out and shine. Uh, we find ourselves in a position where uh, a person becomes disgruntled and they uh, become a gossip, a slander, a, a betrayer. Uh, they, have, they wind up having their own agenda. They made it through the lie detector test of S-E-R-V-E. They made it through the uh, uh, shape uh, evaluation. They made it. They made it all the way through because they said the right things. They did the right things. But then they kind of got a little taste of of it, and they thought, you know, man, I can, I, I, I can preach a better sermon than that. I, yeah. You know, I can. Uh, and all of a sudden, they become disgruntled. But you don't find out about it until uh, you're now in damage control. How do you? avoid the damage and and none of us can avoid it a hundred percent uh we try to do the upfront trust but verify and and uh, but but there are times when when it does creep in there is a divisive spirit that comes in there is a certain pride that comes in in your leadership model how do you keep uh, uh you have cornerstones you have pillars you have foundation stones Later, how do you keep this kind of thing from happening? Well, the truth is, and you said it, it it's going to happen. So, you know, I mentor leaders. Uh, I think that's probably my ultimate calling is mentoring pastors, and I do a lot of that uh, in America and through different groups in, in, in Europe. Um, but one of the things I'm constantly telling pastors is, it's not will I be betrayal, but betrayed, it's when will you be betrayed. I mean, Jesus had a Judas. Right. And so Jesus is our model. And G Jesus knew exactly what was going to happen at the end of that fateful night at the Last Supper when he got on his knees and washed the feet to include Ju Judas. How we respond to that person informs all the rest of the followers who we really are. That's our greatest test of character. You know, in Psalm 55, David talks about um, if it were an enemy, I, I, I could have dealt with it. But it was you. We, we walk with God right. together in the assembly. And the truth is, if you look at the armor of God in, in Ephesians chapter 6, it's all frontal armor. There's no armor for the back. And the reason for that is your brother is supposed to have your back. Right. But occasionally, your brother's going to take the sword um, of the Spirit, the Word of God, and his shield, which are all weapons, and he's going to use them against you. And so how you respond in that moment is the greatest test of character, and it's the greatest, loudest sermon you're ever going to preach. So what I tell people is lead people with an open hand. If you lead people with an open hand, they'll do everything they can do to stay in your hand. But if you lead people like this, they'll do everything they can do to get out of your hand. And occasionally you're going to miss it and make a mistake and get afraid. At that moment, you kind of have to evaluate the situation and ask two questions. One, is this about me or is this about the, brighter, the, the bigger bride of Christ? If it's just about me, then you take it, you forgive, and you move on. But if this person is affecting the church, then you have to shift into a different role. And, you know, the shepherd has, he's got a rod and a staff. And with the staff, he, he, he cares for the sheep. With the rod, he beats the wolves. So there, there may be some times that we've had, there, not maybe, there have been some times when we had to go to a person and say, you're not happy here, maybe you don't belong here, um, maybe we missed a few things along the way. 
but it might be better for you to go find a place where you feel like you can fit in because what's coming out of you is not the kingdom and it's hurting people. So there is that delicate place where you, 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 you can't, you can't use the rod when you're supposed to use the staff. Right. The staff won't substitute for the rod when it's time for someone to go. You know, it's very interesting. Matthew 18 is a model that God gives us for going to your brother in private, keeping things from becoming public. The natural tendency is to have people buy into your fence, to rally uh, to your side and take your side, take up your fence. Uh, but the biblical model is that no one should ever know that you and I had this conversation. If we come to an agreement and we walk out as brothers, no one should ever know. And, right. uh, and there's a process and there's a step-by-step -step outline in Matthew 18 for this process. Uh, but I don't hear it preached. I don't hear it taught. I don't hear it in leadership models. I believe that you, you address uh, many of these uh, in, in the incredibly well-written uh, chapters of the book, starting with the leadership crisis already all the way to how do you build an effective leadership development pipeline? Uh, Michael, I think you've done an extraordinary job and the vision you have for the future to have this base, uh, a man of church outside every base. Knowing that the future for each one of these churches is a possibility of 20% attrition, knowing that going in day one, yeah. um, gives them, uh, uh, it, it actually takes that burden. First of all, shepherds don't birth sheep, okay? Big motto, yeah. <laughs> shepherds don't birth sheep. Sheep birth sheep, yeah. all right? Yeah. Invite your friend to come to church with you next week. Don't expect me to, in my off hours, go knocking on doors and handing out tracts. I've got 8,600 people and a pastoral team that I've got to carry. I'm a shepherd. I don't, not, not my job. I don't birth sheep. Right. Okay? I lead sheep. And so leadership, and then there's sheep development, which maybe that'll be your next project is empowering uh, sheep development. Uh, evangelism, the evangelistic aspect yeah. of having a strong leadership model that has a vision to go out. Don't stay in. Uh, I'll share one last story with you uh, before we have to close, but someone just taught me this model of farming in Australia, uh, of cattle ra raising in Australia, that for years they tried the fence model to keep the cattle in. And the fences kept breaking, and the cost to put them up was so expensive, and the cost to maintain, and they still were getting out. So one brilliant man decided he would build a well in the middle of the pasture, and it would be the only well within 20 miles. So the cattle would never wander too far away from the well, and this was the model for building the church. You build the well, and the people come to the well, and our churches are supposed to be wells. We don't need the fences that we've yeah. had from the traditional old, my four and no more. We yeah. don't need fence building anymore. What we need is well building. And that's exactly what you're doing by investing in your leadership. Michael Fletcher, uh, Empowering Leadership, How a Leadership Development Culture Builds Better Leaders Faster. This book is for anyone, whether or not you are in ministry or right. you are in corporate America. This model is carved out of a corporate American company who defied all odds and closed on Sunday when everyone told them that you can't do this, you will never stay in business. And Chick-fil-A is one of the single most successful enterprises with more God-fearing people put to work. And yes, they do ask you if you are a Christian when you apply there because years ago, uh, they were a client of a company that I worked for that placed people there. And that is part of their interview process and part of their leadership development plan. Michael Fletcher, author of Empowering Leadership, How a Leadership Development Culture Builds Better Leaders Faster, from the great publisher Thomas Nelson, part of the Next Leadership Network. Thank you so much for being with us and sharing your story here on Thank Revealing you. the Truth. We're going to take a short break. And when we come back, we'll bring you the next edition of Revealing the Truth.